Yeah, well, we, <coughs> it's a two kind of a pronged question. Uh, uh, one is the deeper, uh, uh, what are the deeper questions? Uh, there are some. Uh, <coughs> and then the other, the other, the other, the other part of the question, as, as I understood it, uh, uh, is uh, the phenomena of tribalism. Let me start with tribalism. What do you study here at, at Carlton? I assume you are a student here. Sociology and quality. Yeah, good, good. Uh, well, for those of you in, in African studies, I mean, there is a long tradition of African studies, academic African studies, uh, in the United States and in the world. Uh, it's over 50 years, the association. Uh, but in the literature, uh, the, the concept of tribalism has been under discussion for a long, long time. And there are two schools of thought. Like, oh, I want to get into a lecture on this, but two schools of thought. One is the one that, that makes the premise and therefore works on that premise in a variety of field work and other ways of doing this. That tribalism is part of the organic defining features of African societies, yeah? Somali societies, therefore. I mean, in fact, the oldest school of thought in Somali studies is exactly that, pioneered by two uh, Europeans. One of them British, the other one Italian. The Italian is dead, uh, Ciroli, Enrico Ciroli. Uh, the, 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 the British fellow is still alive, he's 82 years old. His name is I.M. Lewis, long time at the, at the London School of Economics. And his argument has been from the beginning. The dissertation at Oxford University, I think in, in, in the early, uh, mid 50s, I think, or late 50s. Uh, that the Somali people have always been clanistic organized in, in, in clan groups, so hostile to each other. They have always been like that, warlike, zero-sum game, heavy duty on this limited identity. And there, nothing has changed in the modern era as we speak, except they now have access to weapons. OK? So they become just, they become just more lethal in the way they deal with each other. That's the basic premise. And then there are others in African studies and Somali studies who have argued, I, I must say, I would argue I was one of the first people, uh, maybe even the first person to make the counter argument in my dissertation, <coughs> and argue that in fact clanism, tribal identities, are a secondary phenomena that underneath are really are a struggle over issues of justice, as you correctly said, and resources, really resources, yeah, resources. And in fact, kinship relationships that all societies have. I mean, if you walk up, up and down in the state of Minnesota, you'll be amazed at how many people, when you ask them, you tell them, well, tell me who you are, and they'll tell you they are from this town or that town, and you push them a little further and they say, oh yeah, we are Norwegian, I'm from Norwegian family or Swedish family or German family, particularly Norwegian and, and, uh, and, and Swedish. Uh, <coughs> So kinship relationships are part of human primordial relationship. That, that exists. But clanism is the politicization of kinship. Yeah? When you put it in the context of a struggle over resources and power. Okay? So, it, so it is not the identity itself. It is what the, the way identity gets twisted so that one can get access to what one then thinks is one's own interest. In this case, power and economic resources and these things of that kind. And you can see that in the Somali society. So that's the issue of, 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 of tribal politics. Uh, I'm not suggesting that it doesn't exist. What I am suggesting is a veneer. And underneath that is a struggle over power and resources. And the more acute those resources are, the greater the contest for this. Marx says this. Adam Smith says this. Both of them. And they come from different schools of thought. So the Mali, Somali case, therefore, I think, highlights the anxiety that comes over highly diminished resources and degraded resources. And then people call on these kinds of, 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 of claims on each other to push for whatever little privilege that they might be able to win at that given time. I mean, you can even sense right here in the United States on the issue of race. 
because the issue of race in many ways is deeply ingrained in the struggle of economic privilege. I mean, what was slavery except a regime of labor? That's what it was. But let me get to the quickly to the questions. Well, question number one, I will grows out of the answer I just gave you, and that is the great questions of economic impoverishment of the Somali people. Over 80% of the Somali youth of your age are unemployed. They have no jobs. They have no place to go. Over 80%. Where do you find among the Somali political elite, including the transitional federal government, where the arguments are made all, over the, all the time to explain that cruel economic reality that confronts the Somali youth. Where is it? I have, read, I have yet to read and see the president of Somali uh, transitional federal government or prime ministers make that as a central issue and then organize the international system in a way in which that can be understood and addressed. Okay. So the economic questions, I think, are critical ones. Second uh, important question, is this uh, the death of what I call the, the telos, the death of collective civic identity? Yeah? Nobody's speaking about that. Hardly anybody speaks about it. The, the best people you would think would speak about this would be those who are seasoned in Islamic traditions and in the faith. You would think that they would be the most people who are best suited for this. And some do. But many of them are really not talking about that. In fact, they, some of them talk about that almost to deny Somali national identity and to speak about being either Arabs yeah, or just Muslims. And I tell the Somali people, we were Africans before we were Muslims. We were Africans before we became Muslims. You say that to a Somali crowd, and you'll be amazed how much hostility you can get to that. Because they don't understand that. They don't even understand the trajectory of history, which came first. And then the final point I want to make is this. Big question, big question. Well, really, two points. One is the fragmentation question. I asked, uh, I met the other day somebody who was a minister in the last uh, government. Uh, the government under Formaggio. Yeah? A nine month government. I asked him, it's a minister, senior minister. He's left. <coughs> and I asked him and I said to him, in the nine months that you were a member of the cabinet, and it's a question I have asked others too, was there any time, any moment, in which the departure of a significant part of the country, Somaliland, cutting away, was ever discussed? And he said to me, not one single day. We never had a discussion about Somaliland. Here is, here is one of the two regions of the country. Italian Somaliland, British Somaliland come together to create the union. These, the rest of the other territories, these are other, this is retail politics at the big level. And one of them says, by now, we're, we're, we're getting out of this. And there is no discussion within the leadership of the transitional federal government. No discussion at all. That's a deep question, because if Somaliland goes and they get that international recognition, it is over for the Somali Republic as we have known it. It's over. Here's the final question, leadership question. The Somali people, as far as I can tell, maybe you can help me on this, I don't see any place where the Somali people are really asking the central question about quality of leadership, what kind of leadership, yeah? what criteria. I don't see that. I don't know whether you want to add something mm -hmm. to this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and... Uh, okay. 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 Good. And, no, I, I, I think Professor Samatar covered uh, most of it, but I just wanted just to add it in a very simple response to what people are now looking for in general. I mean, I don't know if there are some people that are discussing out there what kind of leadership are we looking for. But in essence, the ones that people respond to and the nine-month government uh, that Professor Samatar talked about is a good example of that. Some people that can put their personal and clan motives, 
I mean, can transcend personal and the clan mode. The, the clan mode. That those are the quality of people that they're looking for. And in action, these group of people have done that. You know, they put something in place that people responded to. And if they lasted long enough, probably we would have taken a different direction of history, which is uh, something that we can discuss another time. But that's all I would add to. And I agree with uh, Professor Samatar on the issue of Somaliland not being discussed. Again, these are some of the priorities that one would wish that it would be on the top of the list. Um, I, for one. Very good point. Well, right now, just to give you an example, the priority in Somalia was in uh, security, number one. Number two, the humanitarian issue. Now, from the human side, the moral side, one would say, you know, humanitarian before security. But if you don't have security, you cannot even deliver the services that you want to deliver. So therefore, security, security, security and then attending to the humanitarian needs, then turn in our direction to the good governance that we spend a lot of time discussing and so forth, in building these institutions and all. And some of these services, by the way, is a luxury to the current reality that exists on the ground. Just to give you an idea, Professor Samatar talked about 80% of these uh, young that are unemployed. Perfect, you know, you're right. In, in essence, those are supposed to be part of the priority. But I'm not sure if that ought to be number one or number two. For a government that operates on $1.5 million, $1.5 million for the three months that the, uh, the high tides of the, the ocean, you know, they, they don't get a lot of uh, uh, traffic, I guess, through the sea to, co to collect a lot of money. In good times, they get $2 million. None of the international and, uh, community gives the government directly any money to operate and to establish the jobs that's needed to create industries or encourage the private sector to flourish and all of this is a luxury that we can talk about in theory but in practice nothing now what caused that that's a different story of course that goes back to the issue of corruption that the professor talked about and so forth and so on but what's the troubling part is the narrative that doesn't change you know the situation changes on the ground but the narrative is fixated. These guys are corrupted. These guys are corrupted. Yes, they were corrupted, and they are still corrupted. But they are now hmm, less chronically cor corrupted, if you will. You know. But can we deal with that and improve that situation to make them perfect gradually? Or should we just keep the narrative as it was, regardless of all of these changes that are happening? The government is now providing services. This is not true for the last 20 years. None of them did, did provide that. For example, the military is getting paid. All the security apparatus is getting paid, right, on time. They get, in addition to that, when, when, the, pre, uh, when the, uh, the, the government that was uh, led by Prime Minister Formaggio that uh, the professor mentioned when they came, that the, uh, the army was not being paid, now it gets paid, consistent. The monies that were intended for the army were going into some people's pockets, basically. They get in addition to the $100 a month that they get paid for $60 for food ration, okay? And then they went to the veteran who were neglected in Ispital Martin. Ispital Martin is rebuilt, re, and this is veterans, veterans Hospital, if you will, okay? It's re, remodeled and all of that, and now they receive money, payments, something that they were not getting, and again, the injured uh, soldiers, both the U.S. and Italy pays for the, uh, the active members of the army. Okay? They pay them $100 a month. Army some soldiers get $1,000 a month, plus their expenses, $2,300 a month, and so forth and so on. Okay? Now, once they're not active, the money stops as far as the U.S. and Italy is concerned. Now, the government, out of the $1.5 million, that's not billion, that they have to run the country, okay, and, and still pay not only these 550 ministers, but also operating the city, uh, the Banadi uh, region, and so forth and so on. All of that comes from their $1.5 million. And this is the corruption that we are talking about. But when you put it in real terms, 
then you will understand this is a story, diversionary story, that the IC group did real and, uh, and, uh, and the real um, network mafia that's in, in Nairobi had really concocted, basically, which is really the successful idea now, it's, now everybody repeated without scrutinizing it, without examining it, without putting it to test. You know, and this is the reality. I apologize for taking the job. Please, I just finished. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I'm mindful of uh, the students, particularly, to, to have time to ask questions. Yeah. Uh, and we, I think we can add maybe a few minutes at the end if you are not yes, rushing. Yes. So we can do that. if you have time, we can, if the students have questions, I think, we can accommodate that. Uh, quickly, uh, before I get to the question, and I won't go too long, but I want to make uh, just a quick comment. Uh, look, there's no question that the international environment, by and large, uh, unless you are in the oil producing Middle Eastern countries, is tight for money. I mean, we were just watching last night what's happening in, in Europe. So we, we understand that. But there is enough still in the international community, particularly in the Western world, developed Western world, enough cash still available for those communities that know how to win them over, how to win them over. The 1.5 that the Somali transitional federal government has is partly as a, so meager, partly as a result, because they don't know how to cultivate the international system. I can give you chapter and verse on this. So that's one. The second thing, I would suggest to the international community, if I was advising them today, I would suggest this. Whatever gifts that you are giving to the Somali people in terms of reconstructing institutions, not the famine. Famine, no conditions. You just give yeah. as long as you deliver it to the people who need it. But if it is about reconstructing the country, I would urge the international community not to give it to the transitional federal government, but to give it to those areas which have now shown some evidence that they can rebuild. And Somaliland is one of those places. Give it to those places. Not necessarily to recognize their independence, but to give them so that they can deepen that success and it becomes therefore a model for how to do the rest. But to get back to the, to the encounter with, 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 with the Sharif, the president, uh, we have written about this, by the way, so I can give you the citation later. Uh, but here are some points we suggest. Not interested in being part of that, uh, but someone who is old enough now and studied enough to say, well, look, here are some thoughts that you might want to try. Okay. Number one, so we suggested to him that the first order of business for you should be to build an autonomous, independent, we will even help you find the money to, to finance this, autonomous, independent, national commission to undertake the project of reconciliation that you eloquently spoke about, to rebuild this. Other countries have done that. They have done that in, uh, in, in Rwanda, they have done that in South Africa, and they have done in other parts of the world. An independent, significant, highly respected Somali elders, intellectuals, religious leaders, whatever the group are, to now map the strategy of dealing with the issue of reconciliation and dealing with the issue of justice, among other things. That was one of them. It hasn't happened, as far as I know. Two, suggested to him that you rebuild the 
international invoice. I think you might have even written something about it lately. I mean, one of the most bankrupt uh, places where you can judge the transitional federal government to this day, just look at the caliber, with the exception maybe here, the caliber of, of, the, of the embassies that the Somali have. It is, it is really, really embarrassing. Al-Shabaab is not pushing them out of, the, of Rome or London <laughs> or Washington DC or the United Nations or whatever, Nairobi. Yeah. Rebuild those. And we gave them some criteria of how to rebuild this. Both in terms of what you, where you want to put this and the people who are going to man this and how to finance this. We have suggested that. Blueprint. Test it. Nothing has happened. What you have is the old same Somali formula. This is my cousin's cousin. Uh, my father, my sister's in-law, uh, can I have a job for him or her uh, in this embassy? That's the same old formula. So that's another example. Final example, uh, item we suggested, there were, I think, four or five of them. We suggested that the issue of, 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 of Somaliland is extremely critical. And the distance is growing by the year. The distance. We need to think about a strategy of how to pull them back. And that's not going to be through some force or some other pressure. It has to be through rebuilding civic identity with them, even if some of their elite are somewhat so uh, far away. But the community, and there are certain things that we could do as unionists. And we name it some things that could be done. For example, whatever little aid you get, <coughs> allocate some of that for Somaliland. <laughs> and not just to give to Hargeisa people, no, but rebuilding institutions, water systems, schools, hospitals, whatever it is, so that they know the transitional federal government that has the Somali flag with it in Mogadishu, not only represents Mogadishu and its environment, that's what it does now, really, but that it represents the Somali people, even if it doesn't have the capacity to reach everybody. Gestures make a great deal of difference in politics. And I'll, and I'll just go on record saying I agree with the professor on all three. <laughs> yeah, and it's been in existence the last three years. The purpose is just to cultivate leaders that would take over, you know, in that catastro catastrophic situation that the professor descri uh, described earlier. Uh, and become the leaders that will save the country. And the way we do it is the vision behind it is really to um, challenge them intellectually from so many different directions. People that they agree with and people that they disagree with. Bring in points of view uh, openly uh, from religious to the most secular points of view and allow them to process that information and learn from, because uh, you know, even the Islamic tradition, uh, and, uh, and the Prophet says, for example, and hikmatu dalat al-mu'min. The wisdom is the lost she-camel of the believer. So take it wherever you find it, it's yours, in other words. Atheist, uh, whoever, you find the wisdom, take that wisdom, it's yours. Take an ownership of it, apply it, and so forth and so forth. So you bring in those, those kind of people with the, with the hope that you will cultivate leaders that their horizon is much broader than the current leadership that we have. And again, I'm talking about every sector of the society, you know, uh, including the diaspora. That diaspora, as I said earlier, became detached and it's not really functioning as a community anymore. Right. You know, and so. Can I just add one more item? in terms of the recommendations, just be, because this is a college and I think it might be important to you also. And I find this to be absolutely <coughs> indispensable. We suggested the creation of a national research council. Yeah? Pick up the best Somalis inside and outside of the country in different <coughs> disciplines, in different focus, but a center of gravity where new ideas can, that are operable, yeah? that can be created so that uh, the great questions will be identified uh, and then some papers will be written which will become public policy for the new state in reconstruction, the creation of a national research council. That's independent and autonomous. And we will even find out the money and see if we can find the money from outside the world. It doesn't have to come from the Somali people. So that was one of the other recommendations.
somaliland can model for it and then reconcile with the tfg and say hey now the tfg can get shore up the front and then be that ad or can it be through the tfg right out or can it be the ad that be the model good question very good question well Somaliland has responsibilities. The people of Somaliland have responsibilities for the rest of the Somali people. And I have argued vociferously with them, uh, you know, that, that, that you have to meet your own obligations too to the rest of the Somali people. If you are better off, all the more reason why you have to do something, okay? The problem with Somaliland law is that it, it is ruling elite, yeah? It is ruling, which grew out of the SNM, the so-called Somali National Movement. Uh, it still seems to be bent on the project of secession. And the circumstances in the southern part of the country, the old Italian Somalia, and particularly deep south, are so unattractive to people that they say to you, what do you want us to do, go back to that? We're not going to be part of that anymore. So the problem, therefore, with the north is that the ruling elite uh, are now focused and have been focused on this project of secession. And to make them understand the importance of they becoming responsible for the rekindling of collective civic life is a tall order. But it can happen at the grassroots level. It can happen at the grassroots level. And there are many communities in Somaliland, east and west and central, that are extremely sympathetic to the cause of the national reconstruction. They just don't know where to go and who to, how to connect to. Who do they connect to, you see? That's why, at least from my point of view, I became part of a group of Somalis inside and outside of the country that creates a political party. You can go into the web and find it out. It's called Hail Karan, and part of the reason is to fact exactly do that. And there are people from the north who are members of this. I am from the north. I'm a member of this, and there are people from the communities from the south. The other source of this rebuilding of the civic idea, I think, and the civic heart, is also not just a TFG. I mean, that's an important fulcrum. I mean, the, the, the state is a great propagandist, good or bad. But then it can happen in mosques, uh, it can happen in, among the youth, it can happen in so many different other places. The challenge for the Somali people, both the, whoever is at the governing level and the rest of the society, students uh, in colleges and universities outside of, the, of, the, of, of, of Somalia, there are colleges and universities inside Somalia. Uh, it can happen in so many different places. But without, the, without successfully rekindling the sense of civic collective identity, I think the whole historical project really is a dead end. And Somalis, the land will be there. Can Somali people, can Somali people survive their own political death? Well, Somali people as individuals, as living organisms called human beings, I think they will continue to exist. But as a nation. Not necessarily. There are, there are people who have dis disappeared in the but, face of history. But, but as a nation, I think, na na I think nature hates vacuum. Without a state, the Somali nation cannot survive as a nation. Right. Others will move in. Because if there is no, if, there, if, there, if it's a vacuum, if there's no air there, there will be air from outside that comes in. So that will be the situation. There are two things that stick to my mind of the, uh, from the presentations that you both made, and they were very brilliant, both of them. One is the analogy of the patient that Abu Karaman gave, and the other one is the one that was really extremely interesting, and, and, and it really hit me. You talked about the pessimism of the intellect and the, uh, the optimism of the will. And here I see the two of you. Abu Karama is a manifestation of the optimism of the will, and you are a manifestation by a lot of the pessimism of the intellect. You are not without the will. You have shown that, that you are not without the will. And Abu Karama has shown us that he is not without intellect. Now, I'm going to, finally I come to my question. I'm going to ask you a question. My question is, I'm not a political scientist, nor am I a sociologist, so please, if I'm a little limited in the way I 
I'm addressing this question, posing this question, forgive me. I'm, I am, my field is physics, I'm a physicist. We deal with equations. <laughs> On one side of the equations we have sources of energy or, or forces, what we call forces. And then those forces interact and on the, other, uh, on the other side, we have the result. Okay. In a very short way, looking at Somalia, looking at the situation, and you have both analyzed the situation really, what are the forces you see? Okay, that are the hope, the, the hope for the Somali people. The forces that are the ingredients for a better future for the Somali people. Thank you very much. For both of you. Bye. And uh, well, for for me it's two. One I mentioned already is the the, the youth and, and in the future, and uh, Asia being one of them. Hamid Geldon is Asia's father, by the way. I'm oh. going to put him on the spot. <laughs> yeah, and uh, so one is the youth, definitely. It, it really gives us a sense of hope. The other one is. Of course, anything that would defeat the 4.5, which would be in one, uh, one way would be establishment of the political parties and so forth and so on. And initially, of course, it will be similar to what we seen in the, in the 60s. It might be, to a certain degree, uh, uh, exclusive club of some sort, whether it is clan-based or whether it is, you know, in, in general sense. I'm not talking about Hilkara now. Let's go beyond that. Yeah. And uh, so it could be me and my uncle, my cousin, uh, party, uh, you know, ex-party, or whatever name we give. Uh, but ultimately, though, these parties would, uh, would certainly uh, replace the 4.5 issue, which is really an institutionalized clanism, in my opinion, that should be done with that. So these are the two things that keep me encouraged. And uh, let me let me respond uh, with a with the physics formulation uh, first, and that is the second law of thermodynamics. On one side, the exhaustion of energy uh, and the secretion of energy, uh, we have a concept for this in physics called entropy. Entropy is acute in Somali society now, not just only in the physical sense, but in the cultural sense too. In fact, I have argued in other, uh, places, to the dismay of some Somalis, that the Somali people, potentially yes, but now they have no assets. They have no economic assets, potentially perhaps, no economic assets, no political assets, no intellectual assets, cultural assets, yeah, and even environmental assets. Okay, so there's a great deal of of, of secretion of, of 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 energy, in that sense, destruction that's taking into. So the counter thrust to that then in physics will be counter entropy, yeah? something that will renew the, en en the energy in, in its broad sense of culture and economy and all that. Who would be the counter entropic forces? That's what you are asking us. I would agree. Uh, I, know I would not just say the youth. There is nothing magical about being young. Okay? Yeah. I mean, I mean, I, I was young too. <laughs> so it is just it's a, it's the movement of time in its most primitive sense. So I don't want to overload youth, uh, because the destructive people some now are youth too. I mean, Al-Shabaab is heavily youth movement or youth organization. I'm talking about child soldiers. I think, I think the youth have the promise of the future, yes. And investing in them, therefore, as you have done, and I think I have done, and others have done, is a very important way of trying to reclaim the future and shape the future. So that's one. Second, but a particular kind of a, of a youth, not just youth because they are young. It's just foolishness otherwise. Uh, second, I think, women. Women. But they too would have to reconstruct. It's not just that they are females. It is that they occupy a particular location in the social structure, which has been under tremendous pressure yeah, in terms of cost of the entropy. And it is in their material, personal interest for them to see the, the, the tra transformation of these structures of oppression and deprivation. I mean, the people are dying. Young people, children, and women in these refugee camps. 
So that's another woman, uh, but, but to reconstructing women themselves, and they reconstructed themselves. And then finally, to other places. I think uh, 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 cosmopolitan Islamic scholars, cosmopolitan Islamic scholars, not just any bloody sheikh, no. Yeah. Because many of them are, are, are shallow, uh, and they hoodwink people by frightening them uh, through uh, all kinds of mythologies. But well-grounded, uh, thoughtful, Islamic uh, thinkers and, and scholars. And I see I, uh, my, my friend as, as an example of that. Okay? They can help the rebuilding of this energy in a way that is sophisticated and, and therefore important. My final group would be, and this, is, this we might disagree a little bit, Part of the reason why the Somali people are, in, are, tra are trapped, they have no intellectual capital. We have no intellectual capital. If we have time, I can tell you story after story of trying to create an academic journal for the first time, academic journal in Somali studies, and the difficulty of getting people just to write. We will get the money, everything, just write. The difficulty, no intellectual capital. So the educated Somalis need to become, graduate to become serious intellectuals. Intellectual meaning producing ideas, ideas that are transformative. That will be the other group. Well, I'll, I'll answer the first question first. The, going back to the patient, which one would be the best doctor to... Well, the doctor has to have a vested interest in saving the patient. If he's not morally sworn doctor or indigenous doctor, or, you know, someone who's really, who has the vested interest to save the patient, then it's an either exercise in futility at best, or even worse. Um, so it has to come from us. So the doctor has to be somebody who can really stand for that nation and, and not really get distracted by the little things. And I'm not minimizing the other negative things, don't get me wrong, but I'm just saying some are more serious than the others. And part of the strategic thinking is to know which one is first uh, and, and, and really put them in that order. Not number 50 does not have to be number one. Uh, so we have a lot of problems, and if we sat here, we can discuss it till God knows when. But we just need to focus on these. Uh, earlier I mentioned the security aspect. Okay. And is it done deal? No, it isn't. 
uh, still we're struggling with that. Now, if a group of people can either uh, come up and write a paper as to how to improve the security and not really wait for a quick uh, meeting that's held in one of these uh, capital cities uh, to come up with a already prepared uh, plan for security, it has to come from us. And no one is discussing that because everybody is busy on the minute things that who is there, who is being replaced by whom, and, and so forth and so on. So that's, uh, to me, uh, the second, or, or should I? No, no, go ahead. Okay. The second one, which is, uh, should we just forget about this thing and, 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 and let it go and dissolve the whole nation? I mean, become another Kurdistan or something, just join others or become a little fiefdom, or, or perhaps the, uh, the American Indians or so, you know, uh, open a little casino and, uh, and, and or yeah, a bank to stands or whatever. Should we become that? Yeah. And, well, our area still attracts the world attention, believe it or not, you know, and it's not because we are a country that had a civil war that the world has attention. You know, it's not because we're just a threat to the, that's part of it, but that's not the whole reason. There are a lot of parts of the world that are really threatening their neighbors and so forth and so on. And I was given one minute. So I, I don't think that dissolving is, a, is a, something that we should entertain. Yeah. Let me just add two things quickly. Uh, one, I mean, I would agree. Uh, in one sentence, the best doctor, I agree with Arman uh, that if it is not in, indigenous and it doesn't come from the society itself, artificial insemination is not easy. Uh, so that's one. What I will couple with that, though, would be collaboration between seriously capable, competent, um, legitimate internal doctor leadership, coupled with international solidaristic groups, governments, and others, uh, who really are also deeply humane and they want to participate in the revival of a society that had it so bad. That combination, I think, will be important. But it is the indigenous doctor that has to know how to choose from the many others in the international arena who want to get involved. We don't have that now. I don't have that intelligence. We don't have that calculative capacity. So that's where I would mm -hmm. leave, but I agree with and you. I, and I agree with that point. I would just not go by the institution of international community right, right, as right, it is, right, exists right. now. But if, having countries that right, can assist right. if, with if that we, expertise. If we have leadership that understands the world, yeah. then we can shop and find out where are the friends, where are the people who have deep solidarity and who can participate in rebuilding. Your question, I agree with you. Uh, I mean, we might have that fate. That might be what history has written for us. But I still think that the Somali people uh, have options that do not drive us towards Bantustanization or the dismemberment. I, don't, I, I, I just don't want to accept that defeat. It's a total defeat. Absolutely. Okay? So my argument would be, in order to forestall the happening of that, which could be, we have to rethink in terms of what the great questions are and who are the men and women in not individual, but I mean, you know, teams who can take us to the other road rather than to this one. And I think that's where the challenge is now. And 2000, 2012 would be very critical in that. If we have, this, we might disagree on this, if we have a repeat or a return of Sharif and company in 2012, the same thing we have now comes back. I think, I think the disaster will, 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 will compound, in my opinion. They are inept and they are illegitimate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you both for
Yeah. Well, currently, the way it is structured, by the way, and there is a reason for that, but let me just tell you what are the facts. Uh, all of these monies that are appropriated for Somalia, for whatever reason, the ones that are uh, earmarked for uh, political development or development in general, let me just say, is uh, primarily goes to Somaliland and Puntland in very small <coughs> amount, if any, with the recently, with the uh, 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 global cabinet, uh, uh, the region of Benadir is started receiving some aspect, nothing else, okay? And there is a reason for that, because the people in that area who are still saying we have a flag, we have an entity called Somalia that's recognized by the UN and so forth, are to be pressured to be called South Central Somalia. Once they accept that, the process of Bantustan is done with, they will have their own flag, they will have someone who is equally claiming to be right. president and so forth and so on. And that's what the resistance is all about. With all its dysfunctionalities, I'm not, I'm not going to justify and pretend like everything is good in the South. It isn't. There are some things that I myself am critical of. But one thing that's good is the only area where that notion of keeping Somalia as it is, through negotiation, not through force. Give the credit where the credit is due. The current government and the ones before them did not send an army to the north and force the secessionist elite, for example, and, and bring them into. They didn't do that. And there isn't any discussion of that. Is that a good thing? Yes, of course it is. And we should commend them for that, because that discussion never took place. Okay? But also, by the same token, there hasn't been any negotiation, as Professor Sumiter said. There, there, no one is discussing how do, can we bring them in a very peaceful way and really discuss and address some of these grievances. The good thing that happened, however, again, one of those fingers from, that's moving with it, in the comatose uh, patient, is when President Sharif on the 26th of June addressed for the first time since 1988 on the issue of uh, what, went, what, what happened to the uh, uh, people of today's Somaliland. And, and acknowledged that there, ha there has been some wrongs that were done and said that it's time that we address these issues. But again, action has to follow that. So that's a good step. And they responded positively, but we have to build on that. We cannot just symbolically tr uh, you know, throw a few words here and there and expect things to change. It's not going to change. I'll just add one, one, one two sentences, and that is humanitarian aid, I mean genuine humanitarian aid, and that concept of humanitarianism itself and it, the actions that go with it have to be disaggregated to figure out which one is genuine and which are not. But genuine humanitarian aid, particularly in a time of heightened famine, is the first priority, period. Okay? Yeah, right. absolutely. But, but at the same time, you are right, you have to connect that to the long term. Otherwise, what happens is that you just wait to react to whatever calamity happens at any given year or two. So you got to hook the two together. But the priority goes to feeding and medical care and uh, trying to salvage people who are on the verge of dying. But the rebuilding is what will, in the end, inoculate you from the devastation of droughts and famine. You got to do the two together so we are back to leadership that is competent and that's legitimate and has vision and, and knows what is needed now and what is needed tomorrow and the year after and the year after. Thank you very much. Uh,